this video, I'm going to go over what I've learned from the book Analytical Psychology, Its Theory and Practice by Carl Jung. So in this book, is basically not really a book, to be honest. It's actually a bunch of five lectures. It's a manuscript of lectures that Carl Jung gave to uh, a group of medical professionals in 1935. So um, I'm going to hopefully take you along with me this journey through the five different lectures that Jung gave and um, I'm going to pull out what I've learned from the lectures and I'm going to share them with you, right? So, you know, if you want to come along this journey, I'm going to be releasing a few different videos on this book and what I've learned along the way. And um, I'm going to then be going through a few other books later. Uh, I want to do a real deep dive into Carl Jung so that we can really, you know, create like a strong foundation of understanding, of knowledge, um, of, of the things that Jung was talking about. And then I'll be shooting off into different areas and um, studying different people as well. So if you want to come along my journey with me, of learning about these ideas, then come along with me. Um, you know, I'm not an expert or anything, but I'm very passionate about learning. I'm passionate about understanding more about psychology, about Jung, about, um, you know, even topics like religion, um, history, uh, mythology, you know, uh, culture and society. I like all those different things. So if that's something that you like as well, then stick around. And um, we'll be going through the, in this video, we'll be going through the first lecture um, from this book. I thought I'd also just mention that uh, this book is, these lectures, these five lectures are known as the Tavistock lectures. And um, they're part of volume 19 of Carl Jung's collected works. And that volume's called The Symbolic Life. And in The Symbolic symbolic life. There's basically a whole bunch of miscellaneous writings from Jung uh, and the Tavistock lectures um, fit into those collection of writings. So this book has just taken that, those five lectures and have put it in there. So just some information for those guys if you are going through Carl Jung's collected works, which I will go through systematically in the future. So all right, so uh, the book's called It's you know, Analytical Psychology, It's Theory and Practice. So in the beginning of the lecture series, Jung um, states pretty much uh, what he's going to be talking about of the five lectures. And that is that um, he's going to be talking about uh, the structure and the contents of the psyche including the unconscious contents and the structure of the psyche. So the structure and the contents um, of the conscious and unconscious parts of the psyche, right? That's one part of what Jung's going to be talking about in these lectures. Uh, the other part is uh, the methods. So th I guess the practice, not just the theory, but the methods of which... Um, Jung goes about investigating the contents and the structure of the conscious and unconscious mind, right? So, uh, namely, the methods are three, which are the word association test, which Jung made, um, dream analysis, a Jungian dream analysis, um, which includes uh, a comparative... Um, analysis between dreams and um, ancient mythologies and history. And then uh, the last one is active imagination. So those things we'll get into later in the lecture series. Uh, the first lecture actually covers more the conscious um, functioning of the psyche. So we're going to be talking about the conscious functioning of the psyche. Um, and before we get into that, um, Jung gave some very interesting uh, points about psychology in general to kind of set up, 
you know, some parameters around what he was going to teach in the lectures. And one of those things was that he didn't really, although he said he was, uh, you know, a, a medical profession, him, a medical professional himself, being a psychiatrist, um, you know, they focus on fixing, you know, different um, illnesses, different mental illnesses. Uh, but Jung liked to, he mentioned that he liked to look at psychology in general, um, or he liked to look and analyze the, the, the healthy person's psyche, right? Because he believed that psychology wasn't just about curing illnesses, but it was also about understanding the structure of the psyche of man, because those mental illnesses, um, he kind of thought of as, I guess, derivatives of um, a base of a normal psychology. So we must understand the psyche in general, the structure of the psyche in general, if we are to then go and treat illnesses that are deviations from that general pattern of the human psyche, right? So <clears throat> it's a very, it, it's interesting because people uh, these days in movements like positive psychology and stuff like that, they kind of push this same message. And I have, I have a feeling that one of the founders of positive psychology probably read a little bit of Jung, to be honest, because, um, you know, they kind of try to say how we want to focus not on a disease model of psychology, but on a general application of psychology. And in many ways, that's what Jung did. And that's what he actually explicitly states part of his work is about, is outlining the general um, psychology of the psyche. And so that when we deal with, um, you know, mental illness, we can always uh, understand that that is on top of uh, the general functioning of um, our psychology. So even all the way back in 1935, this idea of not just focusing on a disease model of psychology was already, it was already there. Um, by Jung himself. So I just thought that was really interesting because, you know, in our modern day, in modern day psychology and also in just in the medical industry in general, we are, we are normally focusing on trying to um, cure disease. We're not really thinking about, um, you know, how we can just help healthy people. But what you're going to learn today will really help just healthy people, you know, and a lot of what Jung teaches um, is really in that vein of it can be applied to most people, um, a, a general psychology, if you will. Okay, so Jung sets out um, a little bit of the framework before we get into the details here. And I thought that that would be interesting to read some of these quotes because I've not just read the book, I've taken a, um, you know, a quite a lot of notes, very comprehensive notes. Um, so for you guys and for myself. So I think this is interesting here. Um, it even looks to me sometimes as if psychology had not yet understood either the gigantic size of the task or the perplexing and distressingly complicated nature of its subject matter. So Jung's talking about the state of psychology in his time, right? The psyche itself. It seems as if we were just waking up to this fact and that the dawn is still too dim for us to realize in full what it means that the psyche, being the object of scientific observation and judgment, is at the same time its subject. The means by which you make observations. The menace of so formidably vicious a circle has driven me to an extreme of caution and relativism, which has often been thoroughly misunderstood. So obviously Jung there is um, really wrestling between the subject and object problem of analyzing the psyche as the, the psyche itself is really um, the subject matter of psychology. And back then um, it never really got given that much of a preeminence since then, it is really um, 
you know, cycled up a little bit, but I still think we've lost a little bit of the magic that Jung has kind of has brought to us. So I'm going to read a few more quotes because I think they set the scene really well. Um, because he outlines a few things about consciousness versus the unconscious, right? So psychology is a science of consciousness in the very first place. In the second place, it is the science of the products of what we call the, un the unconscious psyche. And then that's one quote from page six. Um, and it's another quote. Always the unconscious psyche, which is entirely of an unknown nature, is expressed by consciousness and in terms of consciousness. And that is the only thing we can do. We cannot go beyond that. And we should always keep it in mind as an ultimate critique of our judgment. So you see here, he's outlining kind of like um, psychological or I guess philosophical boundaries to what we can investigate. So we can only really investigate the unconscious through our consciousness because our consciousness is where we conduct our methods of investigation through because, you know, we, we do everything through our consciousness in a sense, you know, so we have to study the unconscious through our consciousness. Um, and that is a challenge and a parameter that we have to always keep in mind in the, in the back of here. So when we are doing analytical psychology, uh, consciousness is a peculiar thing. It is an intermittent phenomenon, one fifth or one third, or perhaps even one half of our human life is spent in an unconscious condition. Our early childhood is unconscious. Every night we sink into the unconscious and only in phases between waking and sleeping have we a more or less clear consciousness. To a certain extent, it is even questionable how clear that consciousness is. So he's setting up the boundary of saying like, between our consciousness and our unconsciousness, how Unconsciousness is really a preeminent state of being. Um, and uh, let's find that quote right now. Um, Consciousness is like a surface or a skin upon a vast unconscious area of unknown extent. We do not know how far the unconscious rules because we simply know nothing, nothing of it. So... He's basically setting it up to say that there's this massive unconscious contents. The unconscious part of our psyche is a vast ocean, right? And the conscious part is just the little cap on top, okay? So he's setting that up, that scene there. Um, and also our methods of investigation are hindered because of this dynamic, right? Um, so I've got here that Jung adopts a scientific viewpoint to his understanding. So um, we have only indirect proofs that there is a mental sphere which is subliminal. We have some scientific justification for our conclusion that it exists. From the products which that unconscious mind produces, we can draw certain conclusions as to its possible nature. But we must be careful not to be too anthropomorphic in our conclusions because things might in reality be very different from what our consciousness makes them okay uh, if for instance you look at our physical world and if you compare what our consciousness makes of this same world you'll find all sorts of mental pictures which do not exist as objective facts for example for instance we see color and hear sound, but in reality, they are oscillations. As a matter of fact, we need a laboratory with very complicated apparatus in order to establish a, pi a picture of that world apart from our senses and apart from our psyche. And I suppose it is very much the same without consciousness, uh, without, uncon uh, without unconscious. We ought to have a laboratory in which we could establish by objective methods how things really are when in an unconscious condition. So any conclusion or statement I make in the course of my lectures about the unconscious should be taken with that critique in mind. 
It is always as if, and you should never forget that restriction. So it's always as if the unconscious is a particular way because we can only understand it through our consciousness. Um, and an example here was think of the other scientific things like color and smell and sound. When we really analyze them through a laboratory, through our scientific investigations, these are just oscillations. These are just, you know, the sound is heard in our, our brain makes the sound, you know, it turns these, you know, vibrations into sound in our brain. So, um, you know, I don't understand the complete complexities of that. I'm not like a full-blown scientist, but, you know, that general application applies here because we don't actually know what the unconscious is really like at all. We have no idea what it's like. So, you know, what we perceive, we can only see what we perceive with our senses, what we can um, understand through the contents that come up into our consciousness. That's the only way we can investigate the unconscious contents. And so Jung is kind of um, taking a scientific approach to that and, um, and outlining our limitations of doing this kind of work. Now let's get to the structure and, and the contents of the psyche. So remember in this lecture we're just talking about consciousness, the contents of consciousness according to Jung, right? And so the first thing would be the ego, okay, to talk about, it's a good thing to talk about the ego first, I guess, because Jung kind of saw the ego, I guess, um, he made a few interesting points that, um, you know, it's strange that we have the ego, something that we call I, you know, and it's not very clear as to uh, what we are uh, asserting when we say that um, there is an I, you know, um, I think, therefore I am, right? That famous line, it's like, it's not necessarily true. Why would you assume that there is just um, one I? Why isn't there multiple you's in there? You know, is it really you? What is that I? And that I is kind of what we call the ego, right? Um, but it's, it's, Jung makes it clear that it, it is, he makes it clear that it is unclear um, that there is just an I that there's just one um, part of our ego and that as we progress through time, we will understand really what this I or this ego is more clearly um, as we kind of evolve through time. Um, because uh, he kind of sees the I as a, a consequence of consciousness itself because consciousness kind of needs an I, a center point to which all the surrounding parts of consciousness can refer to. So we need an ego so that we can um, refer things to ourselves, to our consciousness. Without it, we would be kind of um, scattered and everywhere. Like a schizophrenic might have a, um, a very scattered ego where there's kind of, you know, little bits of them over here and over there. And it's not really a, a strong reference point to which the data of our senses can pull all the information into kind of one point. So you kind of saw the ego as an anchoring center, an anchoring point of consciousness, you know, um, where things could refer to it and it kind of stabilized the consciousness. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. I'll just read a little bit of some quotes um, that Jung, that I pulled out of Jung on, on, on the ego. Um, so, my idea of the ego is that it is a sort of complex. Of course, the nearest and dearest complex which we cherish is our ego. It is always in the center of our attention and of our desires. And it is the absolutely indispensable center of consciousness. If the ego becomes split up, as in schizophrenia, all sense of values is gone and also things become inaccessible for voluntary reproduction because the center has split and certain parts of the psyche refer to one fragment of the ego and certain other contents to another fragment of the ego. Therefore, the schizophrenic, you often see a rapid change from one personality into another. See, so he saw the ego is a centering point. All right, guys, I just needed a little bit of a toilet break there. 
I'm ha very happy with myself now. I did a little doo doo. So let's get on with the lecture. All right. So basically, um, we talked about the ego, okay? The ego is a centering point. But uh, there is the ecto psychic components of consciousness and the endo psychic components of consciousness, okay? And so Jung outlines the difference as the ecto psychic components are those parts of the consciousness that then have a relationship with the environment, okay? So sense data, things like that. These are the things that you see that have a relationship with the environment that are um, mostly kind of under our conscious will, okay? Uh, but then the endopsychic components are components of the co of consciousness that are not necessarily under the control of our will, and the endopsychic components of our consciousness are those components that are in relation to the unconscious part of our um. Our, our mind, right? So the endopsychic components would be such things as memory, okay? So that would be the first thing you'd think of um, as a kind of a, a, a function of our consciousness that is in relationship to our unconscious mind because memory recalls things from the unconscious into consciousness, okay? So there's that relationship there. I've got written here process judgments, um, but that's basically to summarize um, what Jung talks about as emotions and effects. Okay, so, you know, there's these uncontrollable emotions and effects that we experience, right? So, um, you know, like, uh, you, you will just, um, when your blood boils in a certain way, you just get angry on, on, on certain things. Um, so sometimes you can't really control how your emotions react um, in response to certain things that happen to you, right? So there's this unconscious, um, not unconscious, but there's this lack of will. You're conscious of it, you're conscious that you're angry, but you don't really have a control over that, you know, um, sometimes, right? Uh, and then there's also kind of judgments that you make about people when you first see them that you don't control they automatically just spring up as a judgment um a lot of the time they're wrong inaccurate sometimes they're accurate uh, so that's what jung's talking about here right um and so they're the endo psychic functions uh also he puts in there something called invasion and that's when your consciousness is completely captivated by something from the unconscious. And so he talks about things such as, you know, in uh, other cultures as uh, possession, uh, you know, demonic um, possession, demonic, you know, devils and, and different things like that. Right. So that's what he's talking about invasion, where your mind is completely invaded from some remnants from the unconscious, okay? So that's the endopsychic part of, of consciousness. Now, the ectopsychic part of consciousness um, are these functions such as um, sensation or sense data, sensation, uh, intuition, thinking and feeling, okay? So basically what he distinguishes between these um, this is basically delves into Jung's personality theory, okay? So, the personality theory of the different types. So, you've got um, a sensation type, uh, so someone who is used to sensing, and sensing is um, that function which tells you that something is, and whereas thinking is that function that tells you what that something is. Okay, and feeling is the function that tells you what a thing is worth or what, how much value does it have. Okay, so it gives you your value hierarchy. Okay, uh, and then intuition is something that if you can't find out information through those other functions, intuition uh, helps you. Jung puts it as you can see around corners, you can um, you somehow are able to understand information that you shouldn't be able to understand 
and he says it doesn't have to be a spooky or freaky thing. He's accused of mysticism and that intuition is one of his pieces of mysticism, he says. Uh, but he says later it doesn't really have to be anything that's spooky. It could be that it is a function when strengthened that you pick up on information that is or sense data that is so minuscule or small that our consciousness doesn't pick up on it but we unconsciously um, pick up on certain information and our intuition is a mechanism which uh, you know draws on unconscious information to uh, that brings that information into our consciousness so it will, it will seem as if you are receiving a revelation from on high, but really it's just um, you're picking up on unconscious information and it's dropping into your consciousness. Like it's, um, yeah, dropping into your consciousness so that you now have an awareness of something you didn't have before. And other people are like, well, how did you get to that? How did you arrive at that conclusion? And the intuitive person will say, I don't know but yet the conclusion is helpful, the conclusion is right, or something like that, right? So th that's briefly what we're talking about there. Um, he speculates on sensation and consciousness. He speculates that consciousness um, is a derivative of a sense organ from the skin, right? So that the skin throughout time, throughout the evolutionary process, um, that the skin was our first sense organ or something and that the consciousness somehow derived from um, our sense organs or something like that right and so you've got sensing thinking feeling and intuition okay um, and then he he goes on to show this cross here and so if you are a dominant thinker um, you would be an inferior feeler okay so meaning that you would be able to tell what things were, you'd be able to think very strongly, very intellectually, uh, but then you would have inferior feeling capacity. So an inferior ability to deal um, with your feelings, to be able to value things in a certain way, uh, distinguish between um, what things are worth to you, that would be an inferior function. And he talks about how professors who were very thinking dominant types that have lots of problems in their um their relationships and stuff and you would find that out from talking to their wife for example um whereas a dominant feeler uh would be someone who uh, doesn't think very much right that but they but they're very happy type people very good type people who would uh you know he kind of refers to a lot of the primitive type of cultures where um, he actually talks about different uh, localizations in the body of consciousness. So it's not that they believed that their consciousness, well, they believed that their consciousness, for example, in some of these other societies were in their heart, for example. Um, but it's not like they just believed it. That was actually their experience. They experienced consciousness through their heart because... Um, they weren't a thinking type of person. They didn't really have thoughts as the way that we have thoughts now. And when questioned, um, some of the native Indians, they would um, they would reply and say, um, "It's crazy to think. Why would you be thinking? You know." And they try not to disturb each other. They they often don't really. This is what Jung kind of outlined in the lecture. They kind of. Um, their consciousness is more in their heart in the sense that they are more feeling type of people who don't act on thinking very much. And um, it's peculiar because Jung also shows an example of, um, I think, Indian yoga or something like that, and how they outline a very detailed um, map of different types of consciousness from, from the base of the spine all the way up to the crown of the head or something like that. Um, and so I think that's very interesting that there could be different kinds of consciousness depending on kind of how your culture was developed and, and different, um, you know, biological um, processes and stuff like that. I think that that's that's a very interesting thing to look at, the different localizations in the body of where consciousness rests. Of course, in our age, 
consciousness rests in our in our mind, in our heads, um, and that's how we experience it. And we're a very thinking dominated type of society, right? Um, so he was saying that these other cultures are more feeling type cultures who don't think very much, and so um, and if they were to think a lot, it would drive them kind of crazy, you know. Uh, similar to if we a lot of thinking types, if they were um, to fall in love, it's a very risky and dangerous endeavor because in their intellectual mind, they're the master. They can battle anyone. They, they have full control um, with their will over their intellectual mind. But when it comes to love and their emotions and their feelings, they they lose control. They, they don't have complete authority in their will to control that. Whereas a feeling type would be able to control how they feel more, you know, um, but they just couldn't direct their thoughts as strong. So that's kind of a little bit of a difference. This is how Jung kind of saw the dynamic between different types of people. Not to put them in a box, but just so you could explain um, why people functioned in different ways or why different societies functioned in certain ways. Or you could explain to a husband and wife, you know, why such and such acts like this and why such and such acts like that. Because there's different temperaments, different types of people. And so he also used that to analyze different cultures as well. So there's the thinking type, the feeling type. There's someone sensation who see through their five physical senses, those things that are right in front of them. Um, they look at what uh, is right in front of them, right? Uh, so they can tell you the facts of the real world right in front of them. Uh, but they don't have intuition. So an intuitive person would be seeing what could be the possibilities you know the, an intuitive person their kind of um problem is that they're always they're not ever happy with what is they always want something um more in the future and that's a problem i personally deal with a lot i always look at the possibilities of um what everything could become um and they're very innovative type people in that regard but um they are you know, trying to go beyond what is and, and look at what could be in the future. And so that's a little bit about that. And that all, um, all these things circle around the, the center, right? So the ego is in the middle. Um, and so if you're using intuition, you're not going to be really focusing on what is right in front of you. If you're focused on thinking, you're not going to be feeling. Uh, and that that's the dynamic there that Jung sets up. So that's it guys for this video. Uh, if you enjoyed, please subscribe. I will be releasing more videos uh, outlining the different things that I've worked from the lectures in this book. Uh, and we're going to be then delving into more of the unconscious contents because the first lecture just covered consciousness and the contents in consciousness. Then we're going to go into the unconscious contents and then later we'll talk about the methods uh, of investigation like I said earlier, uh, the word association test, dream analysis, and uh, active imagination. Uh, he doesn't actually get that deep into those things at the end because he kind of runs out of time while delivering the lectures. Um, but not to worry, I'll continue going into a lot of his other books and pull out more information because I really want to um, build a very strong foundation of understanding. So then we can move on to other people like Freud or we can move on to uh, Alfred Adler or, or whoever, you know, um, maybe some other philosophers or something. And we can kind of then, if we build a foundation, we can then compare and cross-reference ideas and explore new territory. And that's kind of what I'm all about. Uh, so if you like this video, please subscribe, uh, leave a comment, let me know what you thought, and uh, I'll see you in the next one.